Thank you, Tariq, and uh, welcome everybody. And uh, in your different time zones, I'm glad that you could uh, join us today. Um, and I think today's uh, talk is, in a way, uh, you know, very uh, apt, and uh, it's exactly the sort of thing that uh, you know I was interested in is uh, building connections, uh, really across disciplines and across the globe. And uh, Patrick. Uh, McCartney, Dr. Patrick McCartney, who's an adjunct lecturer at Kyoto University and a research associate at Nanzan University and a visiting fellow at the ANU Australian National University. I think the sort of research he's doing uh, really represents this uh, very globalized world. I mean, from Australia, he's a specialist on India. He has a background in classical philology, in uh, anthropology. He knows Sanskrit, he uh, speaks Hindi, Gujarati. And now he's uh, in Japan, and because he's in Japan, he's been looking at yoga in Japan. Uh, and yoga itself, as I'm sure all of you know, has uh, diverse roots, uh, whether it's uh, going back to the Raja of Aon and his uh, Surya Namaskars, or the, uh, what was it, the German Eugene uh, Saunders. Uh, there's so many things that have created uh, today's uh, yoga, which is, and uh, in some ways, I think the declaration of the International Yoga Day, June what, 21st, uh, by the government in 2015, is a way of uh, capturing this for in a certain uh, this global thing as a Indian uh, phenomena. But actually, I think it uh, it really represents a truly global phenomena which may have roots in India. So I'm really looking forward to this talk. Uh, Yoga's box, a look inside Japan's consumption of yoga lifestyles. Uh, I, I mentioned the Raja of Aon. Uh, so uh, the Surya Namaskar is one of those sort of central uh, exercises which seem to be the essence of yoga. And then I read this is a Reiki uh, Surya Namaskar as well. So um, it's an interesting combination. Uh, and we have uh, Joseph uh, Alter. Professor Alter is the director of the Asian Studies Center and professor of anthropology at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, he's the editor of the Journal of Asian Studies. His research is on the environmental health, the globalization of Asian medical knowledge, and the cultural history of yoga's development within the institutional structure of nature cure in contemporary India. He's published widely in, the, in this area. I won't read out all his uh, works. You can see them in the. So we're, I'm very happy that we have both a, a very interesting speaker on a subject which he's worked on many years, and uh, we have a discussant, uh, of, you know, like uh, Professor Alter, who again is a specialist in this area. So I'm really looking forward to this uh, discussion. And uh, without further ado, uh, Patrick, the floor is yours, or the waves are yours. Ah, okay. Thank you uh, for the invitation and uh, for Joseph to uh, come on as a discussant and also to the Japan Foundation in Delhi and uh, the JSI. Uh, it's, uh, it's a good opportunity to, to talk to you uh, today about this, this work, which I, I kind of, uh, it's kind of a, a, a side project these days, actually. Uh, I'll, I'll explain. I'll explain a bit about that. Um, so I I made some slides, so they're not they're not so high tech, but the, they get the message across. Um, I'll, I'll I'll give you a bit of a background about my research agenda, and then how that kind of weaves into Japan and yoga, and then the, the meat of the the talk will be about yoga tourism and development, and then looking at some I guess some more real world examples from field work I've conducted in Japan. Uh, so through its consumption. And then at the end, if there's a bit of time, I'll, I'll talk about you know, where, I'm, where I'm heading with my research. So yeah, basically my research agenda has serendipitously uh, developed. I, I've just kind of followed my nose, basically. You know, if something interests me, uh, then I'll, I'll I'll go and start turning over rocks to, to look, look into it. Um, so I kind of use a bit of a grounded method, uh, I suppose, and just wonder about what 
of things might happen with you know in a quite kind of unbounded way and so the thing that for me has been to to come around to the idea of looking at the biographies and the narratives of sanskrit and yoga lifestyles and so i'll, I'll explain what i mean by that um more specifically what i what I seem to find myself always coming back to is, is trying to understand how both Sanskrit and yoga are transitioned from the mythical to the technological realms. So, you know, like for instance, you know, yoga is 5,000 years old, apparently, both 7,000 languages. Um, so these are myths, right? But in, in different ways, they are applied to, to real world problems, or at least the political rhetoric uh, and, and, the, and the communication strategies uh, imply that there, there is this uh, ability to, to pull it into the technological realm and, and, and have verifiable objective uh, material mechanistic types of uh, results. And so that can, I'm quite fascinated by, by that domain from the mythical to the technological. And what I've come to focus on in, in terms of categorizing the technological realm is basically development. And so I look across different dimensions, the social, environment, uh, economic. <laughs> and uh, it, basically I seem to focus on tourism at local, national, and international levels. So, now, so to give you some uh, a kind of a clear idea of what I mean by biographies. So here we have in the top and in below two different going development of, of yoga's official government recognized biography in a sense through its definition. And so one thing, you know, in the world of yoga, whatever you, the listener, uh, imagine it to be, uh, understand it to be, um, there's been constant uh, interest by yogins uh, about the communicate, uh, accumulation of power across the, across the centuries. And so it's interesting to me that yesterday when I looked at the Ayush website for the to see if they have updated it. How that, how it's changed, <laughs> and it's interesting to me how uh, they rely on the Oxford Dictionary to give give a, a definition of the word yoga, as opposed to I don't know some other sort of shabda kosh. Um, but yeah, it's basically this this idea that it's about engaging and participating and being involved and connecting and being having something to do with pr promoting uh harmony around the world so now so this is what i mean by technological realm right so you've got uh modi g thinks that yoga is a symbol of universal aspiration for health and well-being and it's a health assurance and zero budget now, that sounds nice right but does it is it is it so uh the Basically, you have to have a, a pretty reasonable income to participate in some sort of yoga lifestyle, right? It's not cheap. But he also says that a yoga lifestyle is a powerful instrument to tackle climate change through changing our lifestyle and creating consciousness. Now, I mean, these are just basically vacuous statements as far as I'm, I'm concerned. I mean, A, he never defines what a yoga lifestyle is. No one does. Uh, you, you know, it, how climate change might be tackled is unclear to me and what creating consciousness is, uh, you know. So, but basically the idea is that if everyone were to adopt a yogic lifestyle, uh, you know, uh, all the air pollution would basically disappear, apparently, right? So I've actually been working on another thing, which is creating some sort of multidimensional interdisciplinary uh, analytical rubric to basically try and do, uh, let's say, environmental impact assessments of various yoga lifestyles. 
And what I mean by yoga lifestyle is a yoga brand. So just very, okay, for instance, we could say Patanjali's yoga lifestyle, you know, Ram Dev's yoga lifestyle is, is to kind of give some clearer context, right? This is another kind of side project that I tinker with it occasionally, trying to like fine tune this, this analytical rubric. So yeah. again, with a technological thing, um, so Sanskrit, you know, apparently NASA runs all of its uh, uh, all of its uh, satellites on Sanskrit. They have a apparently they have a secret um, a secret uh, library full of full of ancient manuscripts. Uh, and then you see this interesting kind of blend with science and ecology, and so through the language of the future, the 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 lifestyle that. That Sanskrit has to offer again. So you see that these two, you know, are, are quite Sanskrit and yoga, you know, they're almost inseparable. So that's the reason why they're the two kind of analytical uh, frameworks. So, and so you don't just see this in, uh, you know, in, in official government rhetoric, you don't just see it in, in fancy. Uh, you know, Ministry of Tourism or Ministry of External Affairs, uh, Communications, you, you see it in the most mundane and quotidian uh, conversations amongst consumers or practitioners of yoga all around the world. It's just because of the Deva Basha powering a yoga lifestyle that, you know, there's some moral reformation, some... Uh, through some sort of neo-romantic uh, recourse back to a pre-industrial kind of utopian and be realized. So yoga and Sanskrit become some sort of, in the way I look at it, yoga, you know, it, you know, like the a thousand and one Arabian nights, you know, the, you know, the flying carpet, yoga's got its own flying carpet, got the yoga, the power bank, you know, charging, charged up through, whatever to um to help people get, get to their utopia even though that's not you know actually possible anyway so that's a bit of a, a background to my my broader research i have a few different research projects that i i, I jump around on and they you know they they kind of they they're entangled and a dovetailed and all this <laughs> so on 20 20, I was awarded a, a JSPS postdoctoral fellowship. Uh, and uh, so I spent a little bit over two years at Kyoto University in the uh, Graduate School of Global Environmental Studies. And my project, as you saw on the first slide, was about the utopian economics of, of yoga in Japan. And so basically, I... Uh, where should we start? There's a bit of info on this, so I'll break it down. But the first, the first thing uh, on the the right with Japan, the world map, and fastest growing countries. So this this was an interesting um, infographic that I found, and I, I managed to trace it back through DrDiscount.nl to the International Yoga Federation, which is in Uruguay. Uh, I didn't get any further than that. The, the IYF never um, never responded to my emails about where they got this data from. Uh, but anyway, I used I used this as basically some sort of uh, you know let's say epistemological panic in my app funding application. It's like oh you know there's all there's this massive growth and we don't know anything about it because uh, you know. Uh, no one's written anything about yoga in Japan, so you should you should send me to Japan. And so anyway, I got the fellowship, and I was like, okay, great. Uh, you know, I don't know any I don't know any Japanese actually. So I don't know anything about Japan. I literally had you know kind of you know beyond tsunamis and sushi and sake uh, and and Fuji san. You know, I, I had no real kind of and sumo. I had no kind of. Uh, knowledge about japan at all so it it's it's been a pretty, pretty rough uh, landing in japan to 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 be blunt um 
so I wanted to basically try and understand, you know, wh who who consumes yoga in Japan and how is it different? How is it similar to um, yoga elsewhere? So if you look at the all of the uh, the publications on on yoga, uh, about I think eighty five percent of them are kind of biomedical focused you know yoga and asthma yoga and diabetes yoga and you know now yoga and corona uh you know so th there's actually quite a lot less written about the socio-cultural economic political theological kind of mishmashes of of, of modern yoga and then what's written is actually mostly kind of focuses on the, the global north but then also you know North America, Western Europe. So we don't know actually a lot about yoga in Asia. Even there's not so much written about yoga in India, even you know. So, so then, like, what, what's happening with yoga in uh, East Asia, Southeast Asia? This has become kind of interesting to me. And so I've also expanded beyond Japan to look at uh, also, uh, you know, well, I've tried. This is the thing to try and like do research on yoga in China has been actually really hard, but I. You know, I, I've made some inroads there. So to give you some kind of demographic, uh, if you look at the profile of the yogi, it's it's kind of similar in in Japan. And of course, I mean, I haven't given a definition of yoga. I don't want to. Yoga, as far as I'm concerned, uh, is whatever someone wants it to be. I know that's quite kind of postmodern and and all this, but. Uh, I mean, I'm just, I'm not really interested in, in, a, in, in trying to tell people what to do with what they think yoga is or not. I, my project is, is descriptive, uh, right? So um, anyway, so for, for better or worse, we all seem to have this idea that yoga involves stretching and, and it, it has some, something to do with wellness and well-being and maybe uh, learning how to be less stressed in a neoliberal kind of late capitalist world. Um, <clears throat> so bring all of that to the side, basically, as far as I can understand, uh, you, you have a quite a similar demographic. The, the main consumer in Japan is, is, you know, let's say 20 to 40 years of age. Um, and as the as you get up in age brackets, you see a higher increase in a, a participation by men. Uh, and also during events that run on the weekend, so they might, uh, tomorrow is Earth Day, right? So there's a big yoga event in Kyoto. And so you'll actually see a lot more men who, you know, it's the weekend, they have, they have time off, so they, they will attend. And also with Kirtan events. So, uh, for instance, uh, you know, when someone is, uh, that seems to attract more men also. It's interesting. Um, but there's basically in East Asia, there's, there's, a, there's very much a, a sentiment that women do to the point that in, in Osaka at one yoga studio, uh, I, there was one other guy in one yoga class and he came straight up to me after the class and introduced himself and he said, I forget his, his name actually, let's just say his name's Seichi. He goes, hi, I'm Seichi. I'm not gay. I just really like yoga, right? So, you know, this is a, a, a small anecdote around how uh, men who do yoga have quite some uh, anxiety around how their, their sexuality is perceived. Basically, there's, there's a lot of people that think, you know, in, in Japan and in China, that if, if you're a man and you do yoga, then you're probably gay, right? And this is quite interesting because it's, it, it, you know, the, the participation or yoga, at least the, the kind of concept of a yogi in India is, is the opposite, right? It, it, it's, it's more masculine. So even though today, the consumer base around the world is predominantly women. And so that consumer base uh, in, in other countries is somewhere between 75 to say 85% uh, 
women. But in Japan, it's it's like ninety eight percent. You go to a yoga class, you'll be I would nine times out of ten I was the only only male in the class. Um, and so this actually presented a lot of difficulties uh, for me trying to do research as the hairy, scary white guy, basically, who, you know, spoke no Japanese, trying to <laughs> find out the, the, the inner desires and aspirations of, of Japan's yoga consumers. Who Now, I don't know if you know many uh, sumo terms, but oshidashi is the frontal push-out. I, I literally, uh, in one uh, yoga studio in Nagoya, I, I was oshidashied out of a yoga studio by the teacher. She just, I walked in and she just literally came up and just pushed me straight back out, shut the door. That was it, game over. That's, that's, the, that's probably one of the worst examples I had, but I had quite similar examples from time to time. Anyway, uh, it's, so the this uh, the slide in the in the middle with the, the graph. This was done by the Yoga Journal, <coughs> who uh, commissioned some survey, you know, market research, uh, and it's 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 quite unreliable, I think, but nonetheless, it's kind of interesting. So, for a couple of reasons, so they only. Um, they only interviewed 291 people, and that was roughly split 50-50 men and women. But it's a way, you know, basically you could just sign up to it. And you might not know anything about yoga, actually. So it's quite unreliable. Anyway, one, one giveaway for that is that um, the first, uh, the most popular form of yoga, apparently, is, is Pilates. Now, Pilates is not yoga even though this looks similar it's not yoga right so it's one giveaway is to um, the unreliability of this survey but definitely you could say uh, the next one hotto yoga is is definitely one of the more popular uh, forms of yoga so hotto yoga is just an analog of from bikram yoga basically um but you have power yoga, uh, vinyasa yoga, ayanga yoga, and then that 4.1% is yin yoga. So I would say actually, based on my own field work, that yin yoga uh, is possibly the most popular. Yin yoga just basically is some sort of very uh, slow, uh, relaxed yoga. In Japanese, that is described as yutari, Yutari yoga or yin yoga. So, uh, yeah, so I, anyway, that, that slide, that, that graph is kind of interesting, uh, but it's also mama in some sense. So, anyway, some of the my publications on yoga in Japan, I published one last year, I think, on Facebook yoga. This one and the other one, X, Y, Zen of Temple Yoga, I talk a little bit about um, how yoga in Japan is consumed more as an instrument for aesthetics than uh, at least the, kind of the mainstream, most obvious uh, communication from, uh, from the media is that yoga is something that women do, that it's, uh, it's, it's appended to beauty. Uh, so face yoga, for instance, will help you visibly uh, remove uh, wrinkles. You will look 10 years younger. You know, this is the kind of... So of course, there's lots of different types of yoga and there's lots of different people who are doing yoga. Uh, for different reasons so we can't all put them together you know you you have the broad spectrum you know you have the you have the really quite hippie more hippie new age yoga it's all about spirituality and connecting to the earth and and then you have more the, the, the corporate yoga the gym yoga and in actual fact uh, according to another survey i've got most of the the revenue in japan most of the yoga is coming from gyms as opposed to yoga studios. I think it's about 
two to one ratio. So it's uh, so that in and of itself is interesting. And then of course, there's lots of people who do yoga at home or they do, uh, especially in the last two years, but say watch videos on YouTube. And this is, a, this is something uh, in Japan and in China also that more men are doing yoga at home than women because they don't want to go to a yoga studio. They don't want to, uh, you know, there's some sort of competition, you know, like, oh, that other person is more flexible or, you know, they can do that thing and I can't do it. And, you know, it's that type of dynamic that, that's occurring. And so for a lot of men, apparently, this is a, it's one reason to not, not attend and just do it at home by yourself. If, if, and then also the whole, you know, like the weird thing about the, you know, if, if you would be perceived <clears throat> to be a homosexual or not. Right? So there's, there's a couple of things going on there. But, uh, so, yeah, the, the Journey into Yoga Land is a book chapter which is quite auto ethnographic. Uh, I was asked to write about masculinities in the field. And so because I was uh, at the hairy, scary white guy trying to do research in, uh, among, amongst Japanese women, in which yoga studios are very much a kind of, let's say, some sort of safe space for women, you can say. Uh, the, you know, the, 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 there's something like that going on. And in terms of like the pragmatics of trying to do field work, my experience of doing field work in other countries, you know, you have these big uh, yoga studios, there might be a lounge, there might be two couches, there might be more. Uh, you know, the yoga studio becomes a place for community to, to come together in between yoga classes. Now, in Japan, where space is at a premium, it doesn't have the the space to to have some sort of uh, uh, place where people can just mill about and you know get to know each other. And so my experience was was intensified by the fact that people would come in, they would uh, get ready for the class, and then they would leave. So it was actually, it was, wait, wait, you know, like, can we talk about yoga? Why do you do yoga? Tell me everything in five minutes, go. You know, it was really, it was really kind of hard. Um, anyways, but actually today, uh, this, this other um, article was published. So I'm quite happy that that happened today. Uh, so dilution, high birds and savings uh, is in my new article that came out in alternative spirituality and religion review. So I, I've uploaded a, a, a proof, I suppose, uh, onto academia and research gates. So you can, it's kind of a part two to the X, Y, Z. It's actually bits and pieces that got cut out of the X, Y, Z article. So plus, plus some new stuff. Uh, so anyway, now, uh, it's, get to like some kind of theorizing of yoga in Japan. Uh, I created this slide and you can see there's a lot of gaps. Um, I think basically the first point is that uh, your uh, Sara nerve gas attacks in 95 in Tokyo, Matsumoto, um, there's a before and after thing going on <clears throat> um so i've interviewed i interviewed lots of yoga teachers who them literally sitting on his balcony watching people rush out of the tokyo subway uh you know so he this one one guy a canadian guy actually he he had quite a lot to say um so but straight after that you know you, you chanting om was basically outlawed. Uh, I don't think if it was literally outlawed, but you know things like that. But yoga, yoga took a took a definite dive, and and then later back to that infographic, and there's a, there was a huge increase. Um, 
I don't know what to say much about between 2011 and 2020, except for the the the, the latter end of it um, where I arrived. But I already started to notice something interesting, and so I, I haven't shared it. But there's a I've been making this ah shared one thing i think i've gotten a slide but i have another map i haven't made public where i ride my bike around kyoto and come across a yoga studio so i'll stop i'll take some photos i'll get my phone out plot in the gps coordinates see if there's a if it's on google maps already um if they've got some flyers i'll take a bunch of flyers and you know I'll try and ring the ring the bell to see if anyone's home. No one's ever home. There's all these yoga studios all over Kyoto, and I've never seen anyone in them. Right? So it's, it, this this kind of like I have this article in mind to write about like the ghost town of Yoga Land or something, you know? Because uh, it's an interesting thing, and more broadly, lots of people in Kyoto they've converted their front ground floor room of their house into a cafe, uh, a hair salon, a yoga studio, you know, a pet grooming salon or something. And there's no one ever in these places. And I can't help but think that it's in some sense, some sort of maybe, or A, some sort of failed dream, and B, maybe then it becomes a tax write-off, you know? So even though there's all these yoga studios, uh, they, they don't last that long, it seems. <laughs> Anyway, so, yeah, the, and there's another thing that I came across with just the way in which people talked about yoga. Uh, and I've, I've now seen more recently a, a definite shift um, towards a, a post-yoga world, I, I, I would argue, uh, in the sense that people, people are even dropping yoga from, from their brand and moving to a more, say, generic human movement type of uh, thing. <laughs> so anyway, I think going, if you go back to the left-hand side of this uh, screen, uh, the slide, yoga, yoga in Japan seem to have, um, it seems to be linked, maybe not in lockstep with the, the, the kind of martial, uh, uh, independent style stuff that, that, you know, modern yoga evolved out of, from, say, the mid-19th century onwards and really picked up in the 1910s and 20s. But uh, there, there, there's, there's a definite element to that along with the kind of bodybuilding and just, you know, preparing especially young men of fighting age to be battle ready. Uh so there's that aspect to it, the whole kind of just the physical training. Yoga seems to have some part to play in that, but then also in a more esoteric and uh, so spiritual kind of metaphysical context, there's a definite link between uh, the global uh, distribution of theosophical centers and uh, uh, and then you also have a kind of exchange, say, between you know, Reiki and Shintoism and more tantric Buddhism stuff with uh, you know, stuff coming from India. I suppose a lot of it came from India originally, but um, more in a more contemporary term. So you had, you know, judokas, so judo teachers going to uh, India and in return, Yoga teachers coming to Japan, and so that's how um, the ghosts, uh, the ghosts from Kolkata, uh, end up end up coming here, and then after after Ghosts, uh, so Krim Chowdhury, and then his brother, and so and I'm not sure a lot of people know this, but Bikram Yoga actually basically uh, was born in Tokyo, so. It has an interesting part in the history of, of uh, yoga, yoga's uh, development, particularly at a global global level. So anyway, I haven't really had the chance to kind of do much in terms of looking at the historical side of yoga in Japan going back a century or so. 
because I'm still trying to learn Japanese. My, my ability to kind of dive into, you know, archives and uh, look at primary material perhaps is, is quite limited. But an interesting thing to consider going way back, say, to the 8th, 9th century when the term yoga arrived in Japan, not that it has anything to do, you know, it's like ring on, uh, like tantric Buddhism, basically. But during the Nara period, when, when Buddhism basically arrives in, in Japan, uh, so that, that's interesting. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about more kind of connection to that at the end, if we have time. So as I said, like yoga, tourism and development, uh, to kind of dial it in a bit, uh, I look at yoga, tourism and pilgrimage. You know, if you get, if you dive into the li literature, you know, what's the difference between a pilgrim and a tourist? You know, the, those lines, these categories, they blur. And so that's interesting, I think. But, uh, but anyway, so I, I, I fumbled into this idea of looking at tourism and development spiritual tourism and wellness tourism and so if you're not if you're not familiar with what the difference between wellness and medical tourism is someone might go to thailand to uh get some plastic surgery that might you know might get a breast and enhancement uh or reduction they might get some their, their teeth work in malaysia uh they might get a sex change uh they might you know, they, they, it, medical tourism is about going to get some sort of uh, some sort of procedure done, right? That's that's the main point. Wellness tourism, on the other hand, is 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 preventative. Uh, it's a preventative approach. So you might go and do a yoga yoga uh, meditation retreat, basically because you're just too stressed. You know and you want to learn how to relax you want to take some time out to you know uh recenter yourself in, in in this 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 clown world so that's the main difference i focus on wellness tourism i haven't looked at all actually uh sorry joe uh, uh, at medical tourism <laughs> but uh, it's an interesting topic in in relation to use for yoga and anyway, so incredible India has their own campaign all around yoga and wellness. And, and the, the interesting thing for me, one of them at least, is, is, is how the tourism campaigns in Japan and India, they both very heavily lean into an Orientalist sentiment. So there's a strong re or self orientalizing that's occurring. Uh, and it's, it's unapologetic. Uh, you know, every age is, it's magical. It's, you know, it's timeless. It's, uh, it's eternal. Yeah. All of, all of these things and all of the world's problems can apparently be found in, in, uh, in a yoga holiday to India. So something more or less like that. But then they also always seem to have this like neoliberal kind of twist to them as well. The advertisements that incredible India have put out. So now, in some sense, what uh, I've, I've done, also I haven't published so much on this, uh, but in a, a kind of peer review type of way, I've blogged about it a bit more. I, I corrected the uh, map also. Uh, you would be surprised perhaps to know that the, um, the map made for this uh, Trans-Asia Buddhist circuit, which connects uh, Varanasi with Kyoto, right? So it, this more or less seems to have fizzled out. Uh, it seemed to, in the mid, I think it began in 2013 or something, and it's very hard to find anything kind of current on it. But the Vakio initiative is a portmanteau of Varanasi and Kyoto, and the idea is to create smart heritage cities uh, beyond, you know, some fast Wi-Fi for tourists. I'm not sure what what the, there's a there's another acronym which I'm not sure it, um, uh, is relevant for the you know smart devices and stuff. But uh, <clears throat> so there was a bit of an investment drive to connect connect the two countries through a historical Buddhist sites, and the the official 
Trans Asian Buddhist circuit site, they they actually had um, many of the the locations. Literally, they had them in the wrong countries. So I I, I I corrected their map for them and sent it to them and never heard back. But anyway, if you you can you can find it. Uh, it's it's on my website and you can open it'll open up into Google Maps and you can see so I actually came up with this with this really grand research project to essentially trace to do some field work in four key locations between Varanasi and Kyoto. Uh, just like a couple of hundred meters away from me is the Myomanji Temple. And there's a there's a replica of the I go there, not every day, but I go there, walk around, say hi to Buddha. And uh, I think about how this thing is, you know, come all the way from, from Bodh Gaya, you know? So I, I imagine this project where I would go, I would travel the, the Buddhist circuit and I would spend time in four key locations and look at the, that rubric I kind of introduced, you know, economic, social, environmental. One of the key things, right, is that once once tourism goes up, then this has like bad unintended consequences potentially on the environment. You know, a lot of carbon credits to fly across the, to Costa Rica for a yoga retreat, right, or to come to Kyoto to hang out in the temple. And then you also have this idea of a Kango Kolgai, tourist pollution. So uh, before, before the pandemic, there was... Um, an extra 50 million people a year in, in Kyoto, I think 30 million international tourists and 20 million uh, domestic tourists came in, coming through Kyoto in, in each 12 months. So it's an extra million spread out per week over a year. And so since uh, this whole Corona thing began, there's, it's, it's a lot easier to get on a bus, to put it that way. And uh, that's good and bad. There's lots of shops that are closed down. And uh, so, yeah, anyway, so there's lots to think about. Um, <clears throat> I wrote this article in The Wire, was it last year? Uh, I focused in on the yoga's, yo, you have a question? Patrick, if you could wind up in the next five, 10 minutes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, on, I'm on the way out. I don't have many slides. Um, so uh, yeah, please have a look at this uh, article I wrote about yoga tourism. I focused on Uttarakhand and Rishikesh and, and look at the kind of the promises around, you know, creating all of the, these yoga teaching jobs, yoga teachers in Rishikesh. And, uh, I also did some big data kind of crunching analysis of, and book yoga retreats as well. So, but it's just a kind of sample of, um, you know, different types of advertisements you can find there, you know, so it's temples, it's uh, Shinto shrines, it's, you know, nice beach islands, outdoors, this sort of thing. But this, this one example is, is kind of interesting. So this is the Yamabushi, the, the mountain monks. So it's kind of, it's a, it's a mixture of tantric Buddhism, Shintoism, uh, uh, local uh, shamanism as well. So uh, these iconic images of people standing under you know cold waterfalls. And <laughs> so on Book Yoga retreats, they had this one opportunity uh, for a purifying yoga retreat in Japan. But I mean, if you look at the program, you know, like your Wadokodeska, you know, like this no. There's no actual kind of yoga, uh, you know. It's a, uh, it's kind of interesting how that all came about. Um, yeah, so it's just you know stand on the waterfall, do some stuff with some crystals, a meditation. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> so as I you know I've published on uh, temple yoga. So you have this idea of yutari yoga, so relaxed style yoga, um, or yin yoga. So it, it, they're, they're kind of compatible, but to, to quickly give you a few types, basically, of temple yoga. And it's interesting that you don't see uh, Shinto shrine yoga at all. It's, it's um, <clears throat> and it's even limited to, to 
to occurring within one school of, of uh, also. Um, basically, you have local people who are married into or come from a, a temple family, and they might run a, a yoga class in a spare room for locals, um, or they might, then there's another type of that where it's maybe more of an international kind of presence. So there's a couple of big temples, <clears throat> yoga temple, uh, sorry, a couple of big where the priests speak English and then they offer some sort of matcha, tea ceremony, Zen meditation, yoga class uh, for anyone. And that could be patronized by uh, uh, international tourists. So I, this uh, is it going to play? Yeah, I, the, the, I, I, made a, I made a film about one um, uh, event I went to. It was called Run You. Yeah, so basically, they, uh, this is in Wazuka, which is really famous for matcha. And um, I won't play the video, but it's online. You can find it. Uh, so they did a yoga class. It was like 42 degrees centigrade that day. And then we jogged four kilometers to a temple. We refueled with uh, matcha and kombucha. And then we had a meditation session with the priest. So that's one example. Then this example here, um, so this, my screen stopped sharing. I don't know what happened. I've run out of application memory. I don't know why. Anyway, uh, maybe, maybe that's fine. I had some more slides, but, um, I guess it's fine. I was more or less going to end there with 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 that. <clears throat> uh, there was a couple more slides, but uh, so yeah, okay. It, to, to summarize, yoga in Japan is is uh, is an uncharted uh, topic of of academic inquiry, and that expands more beyond also. Um, into other parts of East Asia, so Korea uh, and China, and then also into Southeast Asia. So I've been looking also at like Vietnam and Cambodia. My wife is Cambodian, so we've done some field work in, in Cambodia, looking at yoga studios there. Uh, so I, I have this kind of this broader thing going on, not just looking at Japan. And uh, yeah, the main points is that that, that there's a higher consumption of women undoubtedly in, in Japan. Uh, and also in distinction to the, the kind of general, more general, uh, I su suppose, aspiration where, or the image of, of the power yogi, you know, where yoga is done, it, it's for physical fitness, it's to create a stronger body, more flexible, in Japan, the, the advertising is more geared towards creating a, a body that's, that's more beautiful and fits in with a more uh, Japanese idea of the feminine aesthetic. Um, of course, you can find all different types of yoga here, stand up paddle board yoga, uh, for instance, um, temple yoga. Uh, power yoga, you can find all of these types. And per perhaps the, the, the most one thing I'll finish on is that there's a one of the more famous yoga teachers, Ken Harakuma, uh, who learned directly from Krishna, Krishna Macharya. Uh, when I interviewed him, he was quite disparaging towards what he called Indian. He doesn't consider Ashtanga yoga, for instance, to be Indian. He considers it to more or less be some global product uh, because there are, there are lots of uh, Indians teaching yoga here in Japan who teach in a very kind of Indian way. You know, the, the, the way they cue 
uh, yoga postures, the, the syntax and the grammar of, of the instructions, and just the kind of the general, I'd say, aesthetic and sentiment is, is, is quite different. So, yeah. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there for now. So thanks for uh, tuning in. Sorry, thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, interesting talk. Uh, I'm sure there must be many questions. Uh, I would suggest to the uh, audience that they could also write in their questions and we can take them up. Of course, they can ask later. But right now, I'd like to call uh, Professor Alter uh, to uh, ask him to comment on uh, Patrick's uh, discussion about yoga in Japan. Professor Alter. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tan. Ka, and uh, thank you, Patrick and uh, Tariq, uh, for hosting this. It's uh, really a pleasure uh, to be here uh, this evening, this morning, wherever you may be uh, in the virtual world we now inhabit. Um, uh, it was a really interesting presentation, which brings to mind uh, a number of, of really important points about the globalization of yoga. And uh, Dr. McCartney has really highlighted the primary issues, which are, you know, how do you define yoga in the context of its global flow and transformation? And should we try and define it carefully or leave it open to interpretation? There's just a profound uh, challenge there. Uh, and it has to do obviously with the kinds of questions you're seeking to answer and uh, how you're understanding history as opposed to contemporary forms of practice. Uh, so I think one of the largest questions in my mind is, you know, who defines yoga? How does it get defined? And what's at stake in defining it either in local contexts or in terms of its broader global flow? And, it, you know, this is linked in some ways, I think, to the issue of lifestyle. And uh, Dr. McCartney is absolutely right in pointing out that yoga has not just become a form of practice that can be marketed, can be promoted, can be claimed in terms of certain kinds of authenticity. But like so many commodities in the contemporary world, it it's, it's a way of selling a whole way of life. And it's, it's flexibility in terms of definition opens up the possibility of it becoming a lifestyle that can be almost anything. Uh, and that's both interesting and problematic. And I think Dr. McCartney has pointed out some of the problematic dimensions of uh, of a lifestyle that can be almost anything for anybody. And so the question is, how does that get claimed and um, defined specifically in local national contexts to articulate lifestyles that are unique, you might say, to say Japan or unique to Australia or unique to the United States, if in fact that is the case. Um, how do lifestyles associated with yoga get relocalized after the global transformation of yoga uh, in its kind of open-ended uh, articulations? Um, it, it, a third issue, which I think is really interesting and important is that of gender and sexuality. Um, Dr. McCartney's pointed out the way in which I think the global popularity of yoga has become gendered in, in very uh, interesting, explicit, and um, you know, problematic ways. Uh, you know, the, the questions about how the practice of yoga uh, enables the transformation of self-claimed gender identities uh, as they're linked to sexuality. And it, it brings to mind actually, just a, a, as a comment before I'll throw it open for uh, a couple of very specific questions, the correlation between the development of 
postural practice in India in the early 20th century as a form of explicitly designed physical education to counteract the claims of effeminacy that had been coming out of the colonial era. And, and it's interesting to see how the, the masculinity of yoga in the practice of, and it's not just a, a one-dimensional masculinity, but a kind of masculinity in the practice of um, Vishnu Ghosh, uh, uh, Sri Yogendra, Swami Kuvalyanand, uh, you know, Sri Aurobindo in his own way, uh, has transformed into a different kind of gendered embodiment uh, in the global transformation and flow of yoga outside the context of India's nationalist project of yoga as physical education. So I think there are interesting points to reflect on and comment uh, there. But I'll just simply end my sort of comments and, uh, and thoughts on this with uh, a couple of key questions that relate to what I've just said, which is to be somewhat provocative and, and purposefully uh, push back because much of my work has explored the same question uh, in much the same way as Dr. McCartney has pointed out. But why not try and define yoga very specifically rather than leave it open to broad interpretation? Uh, you know, so many people practice yoga in so many different ways that it's appropriate to accommodate different interpretations. But at the same time, why not be more deterministic in terms of the definition? Um, and then a very different kind of question is that as yoga becomes popular in Japan, and some of the statistics you gave about 413% increase in, in the uh, period of 20 to 2020 is really interesting, but it brought to my mind, what are the other forms of physical practice, the other forms of exercise and self-development that might be in competition with yoga in the context of uh, its commercialization in, in Japan? There seems to be a, kind of a, uh, a context in which different marketing strategies are at play in promoting yoga against other possible forms of uh, you know, Pilates or uh, uh, exercise routines that don't try and define themselves uh, as yoga. And it opens up the, the space for a better understanding of what it is that yoga is offering from a commercial standpoint that these other kinds of practice um, are are, are, are framing in, in, in different ways. Um, and I think I'll leave it at that because I think, uh, you know, I do want to have time for questions that come from the audience, uh, but thank you for a, a really provocative set of uh, broad uh, issues that uh, really put the focus on uh, the complicated dynamics of yoga's globalization. So thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Alter. I think that, uh least uh, uh, talk in a really uh, productive uh, methodological and uh, perspective, as well as uh, I think some of the questions you put, uh, uh, probably many others would have liked to ask. I would certainly have asked some of those. But uh, before, um, Patrick, maybe I can ask the, uh, anyone in the audience if they'd like to uh, add something or uh, ask something and then maybe you can take up the questions together. If there's anyone in the audience, please go ahead and uh, give us your name and ask the question. Well, maybe while they're thinking about it, uh, Patrick, you could uh, take up some of those questions. Uh, uh, I'd like to just add one thing which is when thinking about uh, yoga and certainly in the Indian Japanese context, when I first went to Japan in the mid seventies, I rarely came across anyone who did yoga. And uh, 
it's probably till 80s, late 80s, early 90s that, you know, you begin to see uh, or meet people who have been doing yoga for some time. In the early 2000s, I remember meeting people who had been doing yoga for 20 years and so on. And conversely, uh, I used to tell my students, um, you know, in the 70s and 80s, why don't you write something on the Soka Gakkai? It's a Buddhist organization. You know, it's spread all over the world in America and so forth, but it's not, never come to India. And then sometime around uh, the 80s, 90s, you begin to see uh, Soka Gakkai chapters mushrooming. I mean, you know, uh, all over Delhi, I, in Dehradun, I met people, you know, amazingly. I mean, friends, parents, their children were becoming Soka Gakkai members and they knew all about Nichiren and so on and so forth. So, you know, I think there are certain types of things, these lifestyle uh, choices people make of uh, trying to live in a particular way, eat a particular food, uh, also uh, reflect the economic, uh, economic environment they're in. And so in some ways they get divorced from the country of origin and maybe their appeal lies precisely in the fact that it's something not too far off, and yet very different from uh, what their local environment provides them. Just a thought on this. Anyway, uh, Patrick. Okay. Ah, okay. Thank you uh, for the, the, the comments. Uh, it's, it's great to know that it was interesting. <laughs> The talk and um, yeah, the questions. Uh, I don't know if I should respond to the questions or to, to talk a little bit about the, um, the 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 comments that Professor Alter. Uh, what to do first? Okay, let's start with the first question about the um, <clears throat> why not try and define yoga. So. One of the things that I've come across in my, in my, in my field work, whether it's online, whether it's in person, whether it's in Japan or somewhere else around the world, is that there's a, people have a very strong idea about what yoga is and is not. <clears throat> and I, I generally kind of let people just, uh, I, I just let people talk. I, I, I've never tried to to necessarily kind of get into some type of dialectic about well, there's this and that and this and that. I mean, not when I'm doing field work. I might battle with someone on Twitter, for instance. Uh, you know, <clears throat> say something kind of silly, but um, I've kind of I've kind of been more interested in in collecting. So this is something I've been doing, right? I've, I've been collecting, like I said, my research agenda has kind of evolved to, to, and to, to, to try and pull together some, some collectivized idea, or at least to start to categorize all of these different ideas that people have around, around what yoga is and is not. Uh, you know, I've had people quite literally screaming in my face telling me you know what what they think yoga is you know people get very passionate about it and so that's also one reason <laughs> why I've 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 stepped back from trying to you know engage people in debate or maybe point out some facts and figures or you know well and in, in this text uh, you know well the chakras actually didn't evolve and emerge you know properly until the sixth century onwards or you know people don't want to know this stuff uh, and there's so many, you know, one of the, probably the biggest issues I've had with trying to engage, particularly uh, yoga teachers, is that I think in some sense they're a bit possibly uh, intimidated. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of yoga teachers around the world who don't really, really the history, the development or even the, you know, the philosophies that, 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 that go into it. And, and people can be exposed really quickly. Not that it's my intention to do that, you know, I mean, just talking to people. And so I've actually found it quite hard to get people, uh, yoga teachers to, 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 to engage. So 
that's one reason why I haven't got into the business of, of defining, at least in a, a data collecting type of thing, because I actually want to know what other people think, right? So, um, but if, and then of course, and that's that's how I came to kind of think in, in this way about, you know, in a transcultural sense and thinking about hybridity and, you know, the origin of the word, you know, it, it relates to some sort of impurity or the idea of an impurity, you know, it was first a, a domesticated pig being bred with a, a wild pig, you know, and so then, so you have these ideas of purity. And so they're, 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 people have strong ideas around what's yoga and what's not yoga. And so that basically is, is it. I, and I, I just don't know how you, you encapsulate, you know, one definition also, because like, you know, uh, with my background in Sanskrit and uh, philology, you know, not that I'm the world's best philologist by a long shot, but I can at least dive back into, you know, say the Rig Veda and, and read it and, and, you know, tell you where and how yoga first is mentioned in the Rig Veda. And it's definitely not the, you know, the definition that, uh, that the ministry of Ayush is, is, is promoting, you know? And so you have, you, we have what, uh, up to three millennia of uh, possibly at least attested definitions of yoga across time and space and now in a globalized sense. So to, to try and say is yoga, is it, it oh, yoga is a lifestyle according to Modi. Okay, what do you do next with, you know, what, what's actually, I mean, my brain, I like boxes and I like putting things in categories. So that's why, I, you know, I, I ask people, you know, what, what, what's, what is yoga to you? Uh, and I've, I've tried to, to contact Modi G through Twitter, his different Twitter handles and get an answer from him. And you know, he's never responded or his, his Twitter handler has, has not responded yet. You know, it's like, and I don't mean to be even like incendiary or provocative. It's just like, well, you say yoga lifestyle and I'm confused by what you mean. So if you could take a moment to clarify, you know. So, but I, I mean, I, I definitely take your point uh, about that we, we, we should try and define it. But then I think if we start trying to do that, we end up with such a, a, a bricolage and may, maybe we should do it anyway. I, I'm not saying we shouldn't, I think we should actually. And like I said, I've, I've been collect, trying to collect these, these different ideas and then put them together and, and at, a, at a level where it's like, okay, so, you know, people who basically identify as Ashtanga yogis, they basically have this idea about yoga in India. And people in, in this lifestyle slash brand, they have this kind of concept. Here's an interesting anecdote, and I'll, I'll move on after this. So there's, there's an idea in India, and I think around the world, uh, sorry, Japan, where people think that uh, <clears throat> if you're going to be a real yogi, if you're really going to level up and fully immerse yourself in, in a yoga lifestyle, then you have to be vegetarian, if not vegan. In Japan, this when you get into the kind of the, the rarefied uh, communities of, of Japan's yoga, it's, there's a strong promotion of veganism. Uh, you know, I, I don't have any like personal feelings towards that or not. It's just the way it is, right? So you find lots of people who will say, oh, I, 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 I want to become a vegetarian. I want to become a vegan. And then the full power of yoga will then, you know, I will, I will, you know, tap into it. And there's an interesting example is there's one yoga teacher. Uh, you know, I don't want to you know, uh, disclose too much information, but that, that person said to me once that they, they're a vegan in Japan. And the only time that they drink milk is when they're in India because of the, is it the type two, the Desi, the Desi cow has the, you know, the good trans fats or whatever. And, and, Desi cows are holy and sacred, and they speak Sanskrit according to uh, Nityananda. You know, so anyways, so yeah, it's a work in progress. The whole uh, defining yoga thing, but yeah, 
yeah, the second question, I, I, I think, um, <clears throat> like I, like I kind of hinted at before, for the most part, yoga, yoga isn't necessarily so much of an exercise. It seems in my mind in Japan, it's, it's, it's a kind of, for the most part, some sort of beauty, beauty product to be, to be kind of a little bit flippant, you know, it, the, the yoga magazines that you find, you know, in the, in the, the 7-Eleven, they're not in the health and fitness section. They're in the beauty section. And if you look in the inside cover of say yoga journal, Japan or Yogini, uh, there's a, uh, there's another yoga magazine. If you, if you go find out who the actual publisher is and where they categorize yoga or the yoga magazine that they publish, it's in the beauty section. It's not in the health and wellness and lifestyle section, right? <clears throat> the yoga, if you're familiar, there's this thing called uh, radio taiso. So it's the exercise that basically kind of... Um, uh, uh, yoga pe uh, not yoga people, elderly people do, retirees do basically uh, in the mornings. They meet in the parks. Um, and this is kind of, you know, this is just gentle exercise generally. And uh, this, this has a lot of a crossover, I think, with, with, with how yoga is positioned. It's, yeah, there's exercise. You get some nice benefit from it. Um, but even amongst the kind of the actual explicit yoga events, and uh, it seems more actually about, in the sense that there might not be any yoga asana even. It could just be about coming together and standing in a circle and holding hands. And oh, there was something else. Uh, oh, it's, it slipped my mind. So I'll just, uh, just, Yeah, I sorry it escaped me. I had something I thought was going to be brilliant, but I lost it. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I did it. Did it? it got close to responding uh, to you, Professor Alter, but um, what are they offering instead? Uh, I think that's what they do. Uh, it, uh, the, it's community in some sense, I think, yeah. Yeah, you may have something there with the community because in some ways I think uh, yoga uh, is, is like those, uh, what they have uh, in the university is club cuts though, you know, you join a club. Yeah. And uh, I've noticed in Tokyo, uh, not just university students, but everyone seems to be involved in uh, some weekly, monthly, bi-monthly meeting it may be going and looking at shrines, it may be jogging, it may be doing something, but it's a, it's a way of socializing in a society where socializing uh, can be difficult sometimes for some people. <clears throat> so it becomes a structured uh, uh, socializing. Yeah. It, it, you could be part of a study circle, academics attend seminars every month somewhere or the other, you know, so it goes on. Uh, one of the questions that uh, from the audience, uh, Dharitri Narzali has asked is, um, she thanks you for an interesting talk uh, and asks whether yoga is being taught in schools as part of the well-being curriculum. Uh, yeah, I, I, I haven't. Do you have any idea? I haven't. Uh, I haven't noticed that. But no. Um, I will. I will look into it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean. So, uh, but actually, so I can, just recently I saw a poster, uh, a small A4 size on the, stuck on the front of a school gate. And it was for, and the interest, one of the interesting things about it was that it was for a, uh, it wasn't for yin yoga, it was, uh, or hot yoga, it was a, like power yoga actually. So I don't know if, if you don't know what power yoga is, it's basically a brand of yoga, which is just much more kind of energetic and 
requires a lot more effort and it's quite diff the the transitions between sequences uh, are much faster uh, so it's it's quite different to the the more the Indian style of you know the static like Shivananda yoga Shivananda yoga is actually quite popular here in Japan uh, you know so you do like four easy postures and then you lay down in Shavasana for say one minute you do some more postures, you lay down. I personally can't stand it. Uh, I have narcolepsy, right? So I have a really hard problem staying awake generally. Now, uh, so, so yin yoga is not for me. It's power yoga the whole way, full steam ahead for me. Um, but uh, yeah, so the, so I, but anyway, coming back to the, the question, that as far as I can, I've noticed there are some yoga activities happening in schools in the property you know in, in in the location but i don't know about yoga in the curriculum that's a really interesting thing i've actually never thought about it so i'm sorry to well, disappoint it but could be part of the internationalization of education in japan you know, yeah you but the uh, the the average age is it, it depends but i would say yoga because it's basically a beauty pro product lifestyle thing uh you know oh, i because my slides the it crashed i couldn't show you but i had a screen full of yoga japanese yoga magazine covers and you you can imagine them they're young they're fit they're lithe and they're super flexible uh and they're beautiful of course right and you know so and then if you look at you know the i've i've published some other articles on your doing media content content analysis of yoga magazine uh um gender and and uh, one's forthcoming actually but uh so if you look basically they have a kind of a set thing uh, it becomes used as a kind of uh, um What's the word? I lose my English these days. Some sort of a way to to dial in, you know, the the the, the is through looking just at the table of contents to see, you know, how how a yoga lifestyle is kind of constructed in in some way, you know. There's always going to be something about diet and season seasonal foods, you know. They'll swing in Ayurveda stuff. There'll be something about gaining power how to become more powerful, you know, uh, whether that's recharging chakras or whether it's just uh, claiming a better sense of yourself in, in your life. And a whole other topic that I've been looking at is um, basically yoga uh, uh, in terms of social justice movements around the world. So, but Actually, leading from that, if I may, uh, I was wondering, uh, for instance, um, is there any connection with the spread of yoga and uh, maybe an interest in uh, Ayurvedic medicines uh, or in, uh, for instance, um, I don't know, uh, in Indian philosophy, uh, you know, the different ways in which, uh, for instance, within the lifestyle uh, changes, uh, medicine, alternative medicines is very important. In, in Japan, for instance, uh, the uh, Chinese medicine has always been uh, very important. Uh, uh, shops are full of them and there are people, you know, who uh, regularly uh, take uh, Chinese medicines for various uh, health related problems or just as tonics. So uh, has Ayurvedic medicine also entered in this area? Uh, because you, that, that there may be a connection there. Yeah, this where Ayurvedic products are visible, it's generally in some maybe high street equivalent, uh, you know, some fancy kind of uh, shop that sells these sorts of things you know yeah, so yeah. it's expensive you know you, you, if if you're working at the combini for 990 yen an hour you know you're not you're not going down 
downtown to to buy some uh, Ayurvedic, you know, face scrub sort of thing. And it's similar with the Kampo, you know, the Japanese. Yeah, uh, well, Kampo, I think, has a wider uh, circulation because you get uh, different prices. I mean, it's uh, some of that is the same in India. I mean, it's, uh, you know, when you go, I don't know, Shainaz or Sen or someone, you know, you pay more money for something which mm-hmm. if you buy Himalayan salt, you'll pay uh, more money than if you just buy ordinary salt. So that's, that's always the case. But I think... Uh, I'm wondering whether it's uh, gone hand in hand with yoga or it's totally separate. It's not really. Again, it comes back to the fact that there's so many kind of discrete little social worlds in which yoga is uh, propagated, you know? And so of course you have the people who are like deeply into, you know, the philosophy and they're deeply into kind of reconstructing some kind of uh, imagined yoga lifestyle where, you know, Hey, you could go back to the Rig Veda and look about how not vegetarian they were, but you know that doesn't have any influence on whether or not someone here in Japan thinks that the you know Vedic the Vedic lifestyle was like hundred percent vegan, right? So there's a there's an a historical thing, and the point coming back to the Ayurveda medicine is, I think you know that just kind of. It, it all just depends, it seems, because you can go to say like, the, I might go down tomorrow if I have time to this uh, Earth Day yoga event and guaranteed there'll be someone there selling some sort of, you know, there will be stalls set up. Someone will be making, you know, like a homemade candles from beeswax and someone will have some sort of, you know, they might have, a, I've seen it before at other yoga events where, um, uh, you know, they'll, they'll maybe have, you know, got a copy of say Dr. Vasant Ladd's uh, Ayurveda cookbook or whatever it is and you know they've you kind of got some aspiration to uh, create some cottage little you know uh, revenue in stream for themselves but you know what, what the market share is for you know some some Ayurvedic product the Ayurvedic product that you see on the shelves that I've noticed, there's possibly more, but the one that stuck out to me is a skin whitening cream. In Japan? Yeah. No, skin whiteners are popular here. I didn't realize they were that popular there. Uh, So Japan, China, and Korea are the top three countries for skin whitening creams. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't realize that. Here it's a, it's a... You can even find, you can even find a promotional material like that that face yoga article from the wire that i wrote i ex- i give it example where they people have actually promoted yoga as, as a uh method if you do yoga your skin will become whiter the, the, uh, one more uh, <laughs> uh, thing i'd like to ask uh, following from the ayurveda thing is the Jyotshi business, uh, astrology, you know, oh. it's being marketed here by the state, of oh. course, but so there's, you know, there's a whole world of, uh, at different levels, but I've noticed that uh, the, some of these Indian magazines sell a lot uh, in, in Japan. Uh, huh. I haven't followed it up, but uh, there's a lot of this there. I haven't actually encountered it personally, but I was just wondering, uh, and uh, just to also add about the uh, yoga in school, uh, Aya Matsui, uh, one of the people in the audience, has uh, she has very kindly uh, written mm. in the chat box that there's some schools have started teaching yoga, mm. and mm. she's given a link for a web magazine. Mm. You can see some photos there. So yeah, just uh, uh, briefly, maybe you could say something about if there's any link with yoga and astrology. So the to my mind first is around you know what's one of the main reasons that people go to a jyotishi it's for shadi right uh so um money also yeah of course uh i mean there are lots of reasons but to to begin with i i haven't noticed anything around yoga and astrology but one, one interesting anecdote, which might satisfy some of your question, is that there, there is a, a small 
fraction of the all of the yoga events that I've come across, which are matchmaking uh, events. All right, and so the idea, so I, I tried to participate in them, you know, to do ethnographic field work, but I wasn't allowed because, well, I'm already married, right? <laughs> so Would you had to, have, yeah, 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 it's fair enough, it's fair enough. And then I, I tried to actually recruit single friends. Can you go, please? <laughs> I'll pay. Well, there Just, are people, people do that in Japan as uh, to make money, by the way. And I know for uh, oh, rich oh, Americans yeah. who do this. Oh, right. Yeah. So anyway, any, yeah, they, they, um, they basically promote it that, uh, well, here's an event and we'll do some yoga. We'll have a relaxation session. And the idea is, is that through the yoga, through the relaxation, you know, some of your, your wall will might come down and you can get to know someone a bit better. And then, right. you know, there's, there's anecdotal stories of, you know, success, you know, they met at yeah, well, a Dutch making event and now they're yeah. married and they have two kids and, you know. So. Yeah. And that goes back to what Bridge was saying about the important sort of community and the social function, if you will, on a very basic level, the social function of getting together to do yoga. Um, and you can see, I mean, the astrology just factors into the dynamics of how that might take on uh, meaningful uh, uh, implications in terms of the development of social relations on the basis of the uh, astrological connectivity there. So it's, it's, it makes sense and it uh, gives it substance. You know, when, for instance, in the 70s, uh, in the universities, professors often acted as matchmakers. Um, so, you know, there was a, this the idea of matchmaking or nakahodo and so forth. Is, uh, is, it's been around and it's been adapted to, if you will, the modern circumstances, you know, uh, in the government service, you know, someone in the finance ministry will recommend a rising star to a minister so that they can uh, marry their daughter or son to, uh, or daughter to this star. And so, you know, it's mutually beneficial. And there are books also which outline all sorts of marriage linkages in Japanese society. So uh, I, I would imagine these are, uh, when these older forms have broken and uh, collapsed, these are new sort of self-generating forms, if you will. Yeah, the, the matchmaking thing, not mm. to labor on it for too long, but the, I noticed that a, a few of them basically uh, failed because they couldn't get enough men. And you, you know how in, in this sort of, you know, marketplace uh, to be a bit crass, but um, if there's some, if there's a commodity that's that there's more of, generally the price is lower, right? But oddly enough, they always seem to charge more for the men to come to these events than the women, even though it's the men who are the rare commodity, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, so it's interesting. It's the women who pay, so that's. But I think in terms of the matchmaking thing and, the, and a broader kind of socioeconomic uh, kind of context, you know, you see someone walking down, down the street under their arm and a coffee in their hand, other hand, you know, and, may, you know, and they've got glistening sweat. They've just, you know, and they're still on the edge of samadhi, you know, this, this, this signifies so many different things. Uh, particularly about class, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a class defining kind of activity in, in, in many senses, not, not to disparage, you know, the, the health benefits and whether someone has some uh, well, uh, well cared for internal spiritual, you know, thing going on, uh, you know, whatever people have got going on, that's fine with me, but, but there's also that, uh, and you see it, yeah. You know, the commercial aspect is always there. I mean, presumably the uh, amount of lycra that is bought for yoga pants and material for yoga mats causes a huge amount of environmental degradation. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. the yeah. clothes thrown away in Britain and the US and Europe are, you know, they're mm -hmm. mind-boggling quantities. So that lifestyle 
is on the back of uh, a lot of hard labor and uh, exploited labor actually. And fast fashion feeds into this. So I would imagine yeah. that uh, fashion houses which are churning out uh, you know, 5,000 types of jackets every season need to sell them. So then you need to sell some lifestyle which will lead you to buy those jackets. I mean, uh, that, even unique for the you know uh, low end fashion houses mm, actually mm, become mm. that. That's uh, the point I was I forgot about, which was in response to something Professor Alter said about just lifestyles in general, is that th this is what companies uh, realize is that you can sell a product to someone and someone else you can sell individual units, you know, and then all you have is that the, they've sold it. But companies realize that if you if you could offer like Apple, for instance, you know, Apple is not just a computer. It's a lifestyle. You know, you, 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 you pin your whole identity in some way around it or, you know, there's, there's so many different examples of, of 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 how brands have expanded into the lifestyle marketplace. And yoga has yoga has done that also. But then it's like, well, who's actually who's who's doing that in some sense? Because you always hear these questions around, or you know, the, uh, these these criticisms that oh, the commercialization of yoga, you know, it's a terrible thing. Yoga is this beautiful sacred, you know, thing, and you know, especially the West is disparaged for, you know, uh, you know, just destroying it and and all of this. But it's like, well, hang on a sec. Like, what's Ramdev doing? <laughs> you know, what's the Indian government doing? Uh, you know, it, it, in Japan, uh, you know, it, you, you, I, I had all these slides to show you, like uh, billboards of like it was yoga studio with uh, yoga in pink and a woman doing yoga and a man at the gym and it's written in blue and it's next to a some advertisement for a beauty product and then there's another yoga studio competing and then another beauty product. You know, I mean, it's mm. it's. The, the one thing that's kind of interesting to me in, in the criticism of the globalization, the commodification of uh, and commercialization of yoga uh, <clears throat> is that there's a there's this inherent irony that the same and, it, and it's about creating distinction and some bound, you know, purity boundary as well with one's own brand, you know, yeah. At the same time that someone's going, oh, look at all this commercialization. Oh, hey, but, you know, like sign up to my next yoga retreat in Costa Rica, by the way, you know, uh, and at the same time. <laughs> so anyway, I'm starting to ramble a bit. I'm, I've mostly drunk my beer, so oh. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, no, no, thank you. Perhaps the beer helped, but thank uh, you very much for uh, interest, opening up an interesting discussion, I think. Uh, so, uh, one of the aims of this this series has really been to uh, sort of uh, take uh, Japanese studies out of Japan, as it were. You know, it's sometimes area. I mean, I've been always against area studies. I think uh, artificial construct, but right. more importantly, you need to do uh, look at uh, different societies, their complex interrelationships, and especially in our world where we are linked to all parts of the globe in strange and uh, sometimes unknown ways even. And there's so many known ways that we must explore them. And I think uh, yoga in that sense uh, provides a, a way of thinking about many issues as uh, Professor Alter raised about uh, not just exercise, but community, about nationhood, about state and so, and their relationship. And I think or at least for our listeners, for our uh, viewers, I hope it opens up new avenues to investigate and uh, think about. Um, because it's not just a question of, you know, India, Japan, but it's India, Japan working in a, a, a very uh, a global context. Right. So thank you very much. And thank you, Professor Alter, for taking the time. And, you know, I'm still very impressed that you were willing to get up so early. I would never no have done no. And, uh, well, but, uh, you know, it really enriched the discussion, your comments, and thank you to the audience for everything they've done.